Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Social Housing Roundtable. Lovely to see some new faces in the room with us today, as well as some old familiar ones. Uh, great to have you all with us today for um, a session that's put together really quickly. So I, I will say thanks and thanks to everyone who's helped get that involved um, shortly. But to those who don't know me or I haven't worked with before, my name's Matthew Baird. I have been working in social housing recruitment now for 11 and a bit years, which Stuart will actually know better than anyone, which I'll come on to in just a minute. Um, I founded the Social Housing Roundtable when I set up on my own back during the pandemic. The idea being, can we have a space where people can come together and talk about what was at the time some key themes, including working remotely for the first time, mental health, you know, how we're actually doing safeguarding, etc. And it's grown into this community of nearly 800 people now, which is just insane, um, of people who come together. We discuss a different topic every week and have, I always think we've discussed anything and everything in the sector and then keep finding more and more topics we haven't touched on yet. So thank you to everyone who supported it. This is actually the 107th roundtable. Um, there are now 52 recordings available on Spotify, YouTube and Amazon. So if you're listening back there or want to see the back catalogue, please feel free to go and find out. And as always, they're free and open to all. Uh, so today's guest, um, Stuart and I have got a fairly long history actually together. So when I first started in recruitment, I knew nothing about the social housing world. And Stuart was actually on the team that I joined uh, back at back at Vengri back in the day. He he was training me and mentoring me very much on that kind of maintenance and asset management side um, and really kind of helped inspire the love of the sector and and my journey within it. So uh, that's been incredible. And, and as Stuart will show uh, when we go through his uh, a bit of his story and things in a bit, his, his passion and, and drive for what for what he's done, particularly in that kind of maintenance operative space is one of the best I've ever ever seen, to be honest with you. Um, he's somebody who actually cares about the difference it's making to individual lives rather than just going, cool, well, let's, right, you so need a carpenter, let's put a carpenter in. You know, it's, there's actually a real difference with what he's trying to portray there. So I'm delighted that he's come onto the round table and delighted he reached out. We nearly did this last year, but I'm glad we got there in the end now that he's returned actually back to, to Ven Group to try and run this new social inclusive desk. So I'm going to pass over to Stuart to do your introductions, and then I'm going to run the uh, the slides for you when you're ready to start. So, Stu, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on here, Matt. So, uh, it's really good to connect with Matt, and it's also great to see what you've done within the space and obviously the positive influence that you're having on, I suppose, kind of people's lives as well. Congratulations on the, the recent anniversary as well. Oh, thanks. Um, today, obviously, what I wanted to talk about today is looking at... Um, social value or kind of socially inclusive recruitment to kind of um, support the kind of skill shortages within the kind of property and maintenance sectors within social housing. It can also stretch across to various different um, subsectors within social housing as well. Um, what I wanted to acknowledge in the first place is that I know within social housing, I think it's a great sector for trying to support communities, trying to help them. That's obviously at its kind of core, really. And um, so the law need to be a lot of initiatives that are going on to try and support people into employment and work. So um, I don't want to, I'm not going to preach or do that, but I've got kind of ideas and I've got a passion about how we can kind of change the way we look at recruitment and how we recruit to maybe kind of take it further a step, further forward a step and set out some real kind of good news stories um, across the board as well. Okay, so um, I kind of changed um, how I was going to start with today because um, when I was discussing with Matt, I was going to say, what is social value and socially inclusive recruitment? So I put some definitions um, down. And then over the last kind of week, um, I don't know if it's exactly the same with yourselves, get home from work and I'll switch on the news and then listen to a whole hour of really good positive news stories, which don't tend to happen too much. So um, last week, well, last night, I was listening to how obviously kind of the, the council was going kind of bankrupt um, and how that's going to have an impact on everyone in society, council tax going up. And you think about obviously the impact that will have on that's probably hard to reach within society. Um, last week I heard a story about how within the, the trade sector, um, we're over a million people short, supposedly, over a million people short within skilled labour, uh, skilled trades jobs um, within the industry too. So that kind of gets me thinking about how can we create our own news and our own kind of positive stories within the sector? How can we change things? And across, obviously, the people that are attending on um, this webinar today, 
and with the skill set that we've got, I think we can have a real impact as well. Uh, as Matt said, we worked together at Ben Group for uh, near enough for kind of like 10 years together. Um, and then I moved away from Ben Group and I moved to a social um, social value recruitment and training provider for a three year period. The, the focus around that was training people who are the hard to reach within society and then get them into the workplace, find them opportunities, find them those kind of entry level positions to help them move forward with um, long-term sustained employment, but move forward with earning money and making a difference to their lives. So I did a lot of work with the Ministry of Defence. Now, what the Ministry of Defence would do is when they're building new prisons, um, sorry, Ministry of Justice, when they're building new prisons, their focus would be on... Which was honestly, really truthfully, just limited to... A... Stu, we've lost you there, buddy. You're on mute. <laughs> I went to mute somebody else and accidentally muted you. I lost you for about the last 10 seconds there. I'm really sorry. <laughs> that, that's okay. I'll re I'll re uh, you mentioned um, Ministry of Defence and then I cut you off. Okay. With the Ministry of, um, Ministry, well, Ministry of Justice to start, say, when they're building kind of new prisons and they're spending their money on the infrastructure of what they do, their main focus is on rehabilitation of prison leavers or taking people out on release on temporary licence. Um, to give them a chance to move forward with their lives. When you look at the Ministry of Defence, when they're building new kind of army barracks and things like that, so they're looking at kind of ex-military and how they can support them. And the whole idea and how I want to kind of push forward or, or set people thinking is within social housing, there's a lot of things that are going on as regards of kind of the property maintenance and new build homes and the decarbonisation fund that's going on. How can we then look at supporting people who are within social housing and give them an opportunity to, to move forward with their lives and contribute to the local communities as well? Um, so I'll just kind of pick out from the, the definitions um, in regards to social value. How can we improve the economic, social and environmental well-being of an area? For me, that will be looking at the skill set that's out there, an untapped resource that are within the local communities, and providing them with job opportunities. Okay, so what are the, I suppose, kind of current issues, or what what do I see within the current recruitment markets at the moment? Um, very much since returning to Venn Group, I've seen our property maintenance teams having a lot of recruitment needs within the property maintenance sector within social housing. And I said I'd support one of the teams the other day and look for some trade staff um, within the local area, obviously within the Birmingham area. And I started to do a search with the team and I saw exactly the same names that came up that I would have done three, four years ago when working at Ben Group. And since kind of Brexit as well, there's a lot of people kind of fallen out of the market, uh, the recruitment market, and the, the workforce does tend to be an ageing workforce. Yes, there's a lot of experience. Yes, there's a lot of skill set that's there, but what is our what is our plan to kind of replace that once they kind of leave the market as well? Um, as we recruit at the moment, the, we're all recruiting from the same kind of talent pool. There's there's many kind of like jobs boards out there. You'll see a lot of your trade staff when I see CVs. They will go around all of the social housing associations and they'll just move from one to the next. So in essence, it's almost kind of stealing the skill set from your neighbours or other housing associations as well. Um, the next part, I suppose, we see a lot of a lot of the recruitment strategies are based about the the short term. It's all about what do we need now. We need skilled people to um, do all of the kind of property maintenance or the kitchen bathrooms, keep them up to the right standard. So we need people who are highly skilled to work within those teams, and it's all always levelled at that end of the market. Um, perception within the market is that it's we need multi-skill kind of operatives to come in and be able to deliver. So it's adding value for money for clients. When people are looking at the sector externally as well, they don't see the need for the massive kind of customer service elements of the roles. And how can they engage with your customers or your tenants as well on site to support them, make them feel at ease and, and really kind of contribute to what um, housing associations are providing for their tenants and customers as well. 
you. So, what could be a, what could be the solution? What what is there? Where is the untapped talent pool? Now, so I'll pass over to Tracy later on. But say across the across the country, um, the spend that is going into kind of training um, new people or kind of retraining people to get back into the employment market, very much kicked off as well since Bre Brexit. People falling out of the employment market. There's currently one point five billion pounds worth of training that is going through or through the AEB funding route. One hundred and thirty one million pounds will be spent within the West Midlands Combined Authority this year alone on kind of training and upskilling people uh, within the local communities. My kind of worry, or say, and probably Trace about to touch on this as well, but, but my concern is that the, this training isn't put to its best use. Where are the employment opportunities? Where are the routes into employment for all of the training that uh, takes place um, within kind of colleges and AEB training partners at the moment? There are your, your standard kind of training that comes through every year. So there is we repetitive kind of courses that go through with your carpenters, plumbers, electricians, plasterers, painters and decorators. How are we as a as a sector trying to engage with this untapped kind of um, talent pool to try and provide pathways and opportunities to come through to get them into the employment market and build for the long term for, for the future workforce across the industry. Um, this is how we can this is how we can work together. And I think like I say we've got the the, the right people in the room, the, the right level of people, we've got training providers in the webinar as well to try and take this from an idea into turn it into fruition and how we can actually deliver on this side. Um, training providers such as Southern City College Birmingham uh, I was with them in a meeting with them last week, and one of the clear messages that came from the college is their training programs are not fixed. They're not static. They want to work with employers to show flexibility within the training programs, to be fit for purpose, to provide a pathway to get people into work, into the property maintenance sector, into property services. What do they need from housing associations with people with the jobs and opportunities? They need that engagement. They need those conversations to say, this is what we need from your training courses. We need, do we need our customer service elements to fit in with the social housing sector? Do we need different skill sets? Um, do we need to look at the decarbonisation funds and look at things like retrofitting as well? How can they fit, uh, tailor make a training course that will fit the needs of the client? So as we refer back, the £131 million worth of funding that goes through, it's not going to waste it. it. Those peak candidates have got that pathway. For me, it always starts at the back end of the process. What are the jobs? What are the opportunities within the sector? I see them on a, I say a weekly basis to see them come through to our social housing team. These We need trades and labour staff to come through to support teams. How can we then engage and identify the right opportunities and um, from, well, to do that, I think we need to take it from a senior management and director level where if everybody says, are you interested in adding social value? Are you interested in supporting local communities? Yes, that is 100% the right idea. To make this a, a, a relevant idea or really push it forward within organisations, I think we need to get everybody on board. And that means taking it down to kind of like the maintenance managers, um, the colleagues as well, who will be supporting people who, who may be coming through, who do need that additional support, that mentoring, identifying the right people within the organisation who can support the future or the next the next step of talent coming through into the state, uh, social housing market. So I think that's how I always say about engagement, early engagement, uh, setting up processes and setting up action points to move this forward from an idea as a whole to then turn it into a real process of how can we identify opportunities, link in with the uh, education providers, tailor a program, and then make sure that we provide long-term meaningful opportunities for people on site. Um, one of the things I'm not a big believer in is things like, we've set up a training program, we've engaged with a college, and then what we've done at the end of it, we've provided 
a day's worth of work experience. It's very good for exposure. It's good for exposure within the market. But what I like to see is offerings of sustainable employment. Where's the employment route? Even if it is then going into things like apprenticeships, superb. If it's looking at um, assistant, um, kind of carpenter or, or kind of roles that give them a step into the industry so they can build the skills, build the build the pipeline, build the opportunity to move forward and, and develop within the sector as well. Um, so where, where would we fit in or where do Ven Group fit in? Um, hopefully we fit in by providing that link between kind of the colleges, South and City College, um, within your kind of maintenance teams where you're looking at recruitment, provide that solution and then support them whilst on site. There can be pathways where people may not be able to get to work or have barriers that are there between it's identifying those barriers and remove those. We'd be happy to support people with uh, a monthly bus pass to get them to the, the site to be able to make sure that they can then attend work for a full month whilst they're earning money and developing their skills as well. So very much the idea today, whether that be with Ven Group, working with Matt, or just working directly with the colleges as well. What I'd like to see is that we start to broaden our broaden our kind of options as regards kind of the recruitment processes to open up new opportunities for young and fresh people coming through or people that are just reskilled and upskilled to be able to gain entry into the social housing kind of property maintenance decarbonisation fund or let's lean on the the new the new build houses that are coming through how we lean on the contractors to make sure they're opening up opportunities for people within the local communities uh, for yourselves now there's a bit of a focus today i know we obviously being i mean myself being from birmingham but this is a flexible model that can work with any kind of colleges across the whole of the country and um, and they're more than happy and they're really eager to kind of listen to how they can adopt, modify their training to support uh, to support your needs as clients. Thank you, Stu. I'm going to um, go over to Tracy because actually a few of the points, I know you've mentioned a couple of times about Tracy uh, joining you and, and joining us from South and City College today. A few of the points from the chat actually that have come in, I'll stop the sharing of the thing. Obviously, I'll, I'll share your details around, but Esper at Ven Group uh, to get in touch with Stu regarding some of the conversations we've had today. Now, from the, like I say, from the chat, uh, Judith has mentioned that it's interesting you picked up on the lack of customer service skills in some areas. Notice the gradual decline from slight pre-pandemic with increased digitization. So how do we propose people are taught how to treat people they interact with? And I know that's a big part of that world in terms of the construction space. Um, and I know you touched there about culture as well, sometimes about kind of going, look, these aren't just people to go out and fix things. They're so front facing that's such an integral part of your business. That, that is so, so key. It really is. And the property maintenance apprenticeship, now we've got the standards, there's more focus on customer service. And we actually bolt um, bits onto programmes for organisations for separate customer service training because they are the face of the company. They are dealing with very vulnerable at times residents um, and clients. And that I can't stress how important that is in, in every trade apprenticeship, to be honest, because it's all about facing customers and clients. Absolutely. And the other part that was in the chat was there wasn't much talk around green skills. And I remember being at the uh, CIA Southwest conference last year. I was fortunate enough to host it. And I sat with uh, one, one of the conversations, one of the ones I hosted was around just how short we are on, on green skills and on green labor and on people who understand the sector. So Tracy, do please introduce yourself and then I'll, I'll let you and Stuart kind of go yeah, back so to the work that you're doing because it's really fascinating. Hello, everybody. Really, really pleased to be here and meet you all. Um, I'm Tracy. I'm one of the employer engagement managers for the college. So I deal with about 600 companies, large and small, right across the West Midlands uh, and beyond. South and City College itself has about 12,000 thousand students spread across seven campuses for those of you that don't know 5,000 of those are 16 to 18 year olds and we're the fifth largest UK um, in the country and the largest in the region in terms of construction though we're the largest construction college in the Midlands and we have about 4,000 learners attend day um, and evening provision now 4,000 learners in Bordesley Green in Birmingham. Now let's just pause for a second. That's 4,000 full-time and part-time students 
who at some point in their training are going to need jobs. Okay. So what the college do regularly is we have uh, meet the employer events where employers come in and they'll see our students um, and they will make job offers based on seeing those students finishing their studies. And they also take them part way through their studies as well. And our learners age ranges are between 14 and 60. We serve though, based in Bordesley Green and where our campuses are, we serve some of the most disadvantaged, deprived areas in the city. Okay. Um, so it's really key to us to help local communities and it's all in all our best interests to find these, these, these people jobs. Now, in terms of sort of routes into the social housing sector, we've developed something called a Construction Skills Alliance where we bring um, employers around a table. It's important to us to be developing a pipeline of talent fit for the industry fit for all the retrofitting work that's coming that's coming forward and to enter the sector but also to develop a range of courses that that's fit for what for, for what you guys do um it's employer engagement i think in colleges has changed in the sense that we don't produce a menu of programs anymore you tell us what your industry needs and then we go out and, and, and recruit those people through the college and through our construction networks um, so you're actually getting a bespoke programme that's fit for the industry. I don't know whether you've heard of sector-based work academy programmes, but just an example, um, a selection of companies might come to us um, or one large organisation and say, right, we need six property maintenance individuals or we need four carpenters or whatever it might be um, to carry out this work in these areas for this, this length of time. What the colleges do um, is they would recruit through job centres, through through local communities, and we would bring together a selection of people that you would meet. Um, they would go through a bespoke two or three week programme tailored by you at college, and then they'd go out into those organisations as a bit of a work experience trial um, type model. And then at the end of that time, you would interview a, you would interview these people and obviously um, offer them jobs if, if they were suitable. So, so that's the kind of model that, that, that we run. Some organisations know exactly what they want and say, right, we need six apprentices in property maintenance. And we work with lots of social housing organisations where we do this, like Bromford Platform, Sanctuary Housing, Equins, Midlands Hearts. Um, so those some of those organisations will come to us and say property maintenance or carpentry or whatever it might be. Um, others um, prefer a different model and it might be a selection of people, our, our existing students go out on work experience, do a couple of days or do a few weeks and they've got that valuable work experience at the end of that programme. But the people who shine often secure apprentice jobs through that. So that, that that's another sort of model. We deliver apprenticeships from level two to level six. It's normal for us to start um, somebody on a level two programme and then four years later or five years later, they're absolute specialists in the same company studying towards their degree or level four qualifications in, in various areas. Um, for us really though, we want employers to drive this and you should be driving this. Stuart mentioned about we've, Colleges have secured millions of pounds worth of funding. The AEB funding is amazing to be able to upskill because the retrofit, all of the retrofit technologies and all the work that's coming through and new builds in all of the green stuff, um, that's going to be really, really beneficial for organisations wanting to upskill existing people to carry out work on solar PV, ground source heat pumps and all of the new technology that's coming through. Um, We've got a lot of funding. We've got two exciting, three exciting projects actually in terms of decarbonisation going ahead at the moment. We're building a net zero house and a 1930s house right next door to each other. We've been allocated 435,000 to be able to do this. In addition to that, there's two electrification training rigs going next door. 
that will deliver all of the solar PV, battery storage, EV charging installation points, etc. These will be finished at the middle of next year and will act as training rigs for the industry to come in and work on these, the, the, these That's training That's what I was rigs. going to ask about, Tracy. So, because some, I mean, Steve just put there in the chat, you know, the housing sector is crying out for green skills. What are we doing to be proactive and create yeah. a training scheme for that? So, is some of the problem really that because I guess so it's changing all the time, they're trying to get ahead it of it, it's difficult. Is. So, therefore, what you're doing is building something there so that you can develop those green skills quickly. Yeah, but 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 way before, as the houses are being built, we want we, we've we've we created a construction skills alliance to be able for employers to be able to come and look at the houses through time and, and, and look at our progress. So we want employers to be part of this. We want them to steer and inform us what they need so we can be a CPD and all our staff and developing all of these programs ready to go. And B, we want the organisations to be able to be part of it with us and come on that journey with us because it's, yeah, absolutely. Stuart, that's where you make the most change. I think that's, the, I think that's yeah. the thing. I think Steve, Steve it, uh, we, what Steve's saying as well is about we need to be looking at green skills and how it works in there. And I think that's at times what the disconnect is, is obviously, Steve, you're within the industry and you you know what the industry needs. And then there's a lot of courses that are going on that sometimes are generic courses, but I know from my dealings with the combined authority in the past of what the combined authority when they hold this person money. So the person money goes from the West Midlands combined authority out to the colleges and establishments. Um, in regards to when they allocate that funding out, what they will be saying is we will give you say a million pounds worth of funding from that million pounds worth of funding, however many people that trains through, they expect 65% of people who have received training to go into employment. So if the courses that are being delivered aren't fit for purpose for the industry, yeah, then that, that figure and that number won't be achieved. And then funding can be lost in a way that goes through. So I think the important thing is to be able to take the understanding from the clients, what is needed, build the, build the actual training courses off the back of that to make them bespoke to give to show that that money, like say the the one hundred and thirty one million pounds worth that's going across the West Midlands Command Authority, making sure that that actually that that will actually turn into fruition of people getting employment and jobs. And this is Absolutely. where that social value piece, isn't it, Stuart? Because I know when we were talking before, we brought to brought the thing to the table today. It can be very difficult sometimes for businesses to really understand. Uh, the actual true value of social value apologies for the double use of the word there but you were saying that in terms of the difference when you invest in a community and you invest in these as a social value cost is huge isn't it did you have any of the numbers to hand yeah so well, there's there's actually i suppose in a way what you talk about um when you talk about social value and kind of reporting as well there's something called the national toms framework it's targets objectives and measures so what does that mean as an organization so if you employed a um, 16 to 19 year old who's kind of unemployed, the almost like what they say, the cost of society is around 30, I think it's about 35,000 pounds. They say all in all across a year. So when you recruit and when you recruit by this kind of method or you're going there, then there is actually a report that can be produced. And we, we can produce these reports where it's, this is how much social value you've added through your recruitment strategies as well. So. It's not only does the funding go to good use, but also as well, you reduce the dependence of people within society to different elements. I'll be more than happy to kind of share the, the national tops with the, the group afterwards as well to show how this can be broken down. A lot of it's to do with community engagement and how you engage, put back into society, which I know social housing or, or housing associations already do so much of that as well. And then as regards kind of the social value reports, we can build that because like I say at the start of the, the meeting, say when I go home and watch the, the news, I don't see too much good news, but I think we can create our own good news by showing how we're adapting, how we're utilising the funding that's coming through from the government to make sure that, one, the training's fit for purpose, but two, we've got those pathways to come through into employment. And that's how we've got the right people on the webinar, and that's how we can create opportunities there as well. Absolutely agree. Just yeah. before I jump to Kerry and I bring him in, Tracy, I'm going to go to yourself because obviously I know on some of that point there, 
some uh, Judith just put in the chat that you know is funding going to be affected by councils going bankrupt? How can we make sure the money's there to spend? You're being given the money, aren't you? Yeah, we've we've got we've got a lot of money to spend. Um, certainly on the decarbonisation electrification front, we've got money to develop and change and and have real influence over um, how, what we embed into our apprenticeships. Um, yeah we, we've got the money if you if organ we need organizations to tell us what they need and often an off-the-shelf plumbing and heating four-year apprenticeship is not the answer for organizations we want to know multi-skill thing is becoming bigger and bigger and property bigger, maintenance it? yeah and, 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 and the housing organizations um we work with um some of the best case studies that we've been able to get are from where we recruit for the for housing organisations. They they've ring fenced it to their um, their residents, and they've had their residents obviously applying for the roles and securing jobs in the industry. So you know, in terms of social value, as I say, our college serves some of the most disadvantaged, uh, deprived areas in the west and, Midlands, and in the are, country and actually yours, and, there's, and there's so many doing it and it's getting yeah. that, that connection yeah. to you. kerry i'm yeah. going to bring you in because we've got a couple of waiting sorry tracy but kerry do come in yeah so um so i work for futures housing we're in the east midlands i'm also um a non-exec for access training which is an independent training provider in the east midlands of which we're a 50 percent shareholder of um <clears throat> i think stuart's point around pathways is really interesting and, and actually to pick up on Tracy's point, I don't think any one organisation is going to be able to fix any of this stuff um, because I think it's actually quite a complex problem. Um, because in reality, I think those people that are likely to be able to access uh, colleges and higher education and, and those kind of things are probably, I wouldn't say they're already doing it, but I think there's that, access. For me, it's those people that need different, I guess, support. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if we work predominantly in rural communities. So how do we get customers, how do we get those disadvantaged people in those communities to the training provider? How do we connect them with employment? How do we make sure that actually those life skills, and, and so one of the things that Access does quite a bit of is really providing those broader skills around, how do you just know to pack your lunch, how to get onto the right bus, turn yeah. up on time, um, dress appropriately, communicate effectively, what's going on with your mental health. There's a whole raft of things um, that I think in terms of being able to create genuine social value um, that really makes a difference. We need you know, that pathway. You need to look at every step along the way. Um, interestingly, we've really struggled with the, um, the property maintenance piece, Tracy, and the, as an organisation, what we found was that at the end of the property maintenance apprenticeship, they got to the end of it and they weren't really be able to do any one thing. So we've gone down back to the whole trades piece, which which is both quicker to get them into employment and out of apprenticeship money type stuff. But I, I think what's interesting, having seen the housing association piece, the contractor piece. I mean, we're predominantly a DLO. We've got most of our in-house staff, but um, and looking at how access supports some of those things, it's we need to have a more joined up conversation really in order to be able to facilitate. But um, we struggle with things like the combined authority because our customers and our staff are not going to get themselves into Birmingham. They're probably not going to go to Derby, Nottingham or Leicester either. They want to. They want to be able to get a bus into Ripley uh, or into, you know, um, Heat, uh, uh, Alfreton or some close. Once you start going beyond a, a simple bus ride, do you know what? They're not going to do it. They're going to go and work at Aldi or they're going to work at Tesco or somewhere they can get to e uh, easily. So um, I think it's a really complex problem, actually. And Stuart, I know there's something you're seeing, isn't it? In terms of, I mean, this is literally your job doing this nationwide, which is fitting that kind of realizing just how many people want to talk to each other but for some reason the connections aren't there it is as uh, i think kerry hit the nail on that one it is about it, it's almost like a journey say so for me i like to say you've always got to start so the good thing is what people are saying with the industry is there are job opportunities once you've looked at the job opportunities then it's a case of kind of breaking it down to what are the job opportunities for people coming in at an entry level then it's the, the place where we want to engage with people who are within social housing 
So one, you have to do the kind of visibility and kind of marketing of the opportunities that are there and how the organisation are looking to support people into employment and go along this pathway. Uh, thank you very much, Stu. Yeah, no, I absolutely. I'm going to go to the bit in the chat in a moment. Yeah. Uh, Steve, I'm going to bring you in uh, just for going to that chat piece. Steve, do please join us. Hi, <clears throat> thanks very much. Um, I'm a tenant with Yorkshire Housing, and I I just think the whole sector and the training sectors have got their heads in the sand. We've reached a point where, on average, we need to retrofit a million homes a year. That's one every two minutes. Now, Tracy was talking about apprenticeships, four-year apprenticeships and things like that. Where are we going to be in four years' time if we don't start training the people now for the green skills? And I'm not just talking about installers. We need assessors, planners, surveyors, uh, you know, the whole raft of it. I understand Stuart's point about um, when you get funding, you you have to look at getting 65% into employment. But if we don't start training these people now, there's no way we're going to get, you know, get the work done. I mean, I mean, you're looking at half a million people need to be trained up at least to get this work done. If we don't start now, then we're not going to get there. Because this, Steve, this was exactly the conversation we had at the the Southwest Conference. Actually, Steve, I agree with you. With it was I was just pulling up who it was. So we had Hannah Gibson from Sovereign Housing, and uh, there was Debansu Das from the Housing Diversity Network. And the amount of skill shortages that there are, are absolutely massive. And I, I completely agree with what you're saying, and that we are really short. However, part of the problem, and I'd love to hear from Stuart and Tracy on this, is that. We've known this is coming for a long time, and I'm sure uh, Kerry agrees with a lot of this. We've known this is coming, but the engagement we've struggled to find between training providers and housing providers, DLOs, house builds, whoever it might be, to actually develop those skills. We've been so hesitant for such a long time to develop those and to really go, we need to spend money in this, that, that we've kind of got stuck. And now that the quickest way and arguably most affordable way is through apprenticeships like the ones that Tracy are running, and yet the engagement still isn't quite there. And Stuart, I don't know how you're finding yeah, it. Yeah, I, I, I think there's, when you look at apprenticeships and things like that, that's, like I say, it's almost like building for a long-term future. And, and and Steve, you're exactly right to say, that there's an issue that's like here and now. But instead, I mean, it's, look at it in that way, it is an issue. But in another way, it's a great opportunity. The opportunity's there, and they say, there's things called lots of, kind of skills boot camps, and the, there's different ways of kind of, training as well or utilizing the money that's allocated to the training providers so working with head association or with the contractors to see what needs to be delivered from a, a green skills uh, point of view we need to understand what skill set is required and how can we make the training bespoke but also not a, a two to three year training program there can be opportunities there that can help deliver with um, people working alongside of kind of electricians for solar panels or or working that may not be kind of highly skilled at the time but give people exposure to certain elements of the kind of green skills and how can they can fit into the bigger picture to help deliver on this because it is here and now and I say for me that's a good thing but you need to work in a project way of who needs what are the jobs that they need to recruit for now who are the contracts are delivering this there, there is a um, a kind of a group that's going to be set up through Birmingham uh, Council, which is part of the decarbonisation uh, kind of fund and group as well, which will come together, which is part of it is identifying what skills are needed to make sure that that is filtered through to the colleges to make sure they're delivering project, um, delivering training courses that are fit for purpose. And for me, they need to be sure to sharper skills like your eight week programmes to get people that are ready here and now rather than apprenticeships which are going to be two three years down the line and that's how oh. we can hopefully fit in with that steve, yeah, I, steve, I, 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 sorry steve i would love you to be part of our construction skills alliance where are you based again sorry south yorkshire 
Oh, okay. <laughs> You're probably a little bit out of area, but you'll you'll find one of your one of your local colleges is doing this. They will have a decarbonisation fund. They will have access to AEB funding. Have you worked with any local colleges or anyone, Steve? No, I, I haven't actually spoken to them. I, I I've uh, spoken to um, oh, I can't think of his name now. Retrofit. Um, right. Okay. Academy. The Retrofit Academy. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, so I, I I just think that um. I mean, you're in in the West Midlands, Tracy, and and yeah. you're looking at your area, and you know there may be a college in Sheffield that's looking at it for for the area I live in. Yeah. But surely this shouldn't be isolated to to the large towns. I mean, going back to something Kerry was saying about those that live in rural areas, you know, we should make this a nationwide. Yeah. Um. um a nationwide thing and not concentrate the training centers in the large towns only, you know, it be, because people from, I don't know, let's just for argument's sake say people from Humberside may not want to travel to Birmingham to do the training because the length of time it takes, they may be family people, you know, they, they, they may have close ties to the area they live. Let's, Let's make it a nationwide thing, have satellite training areas around the country so people over the four years of the apprenticeship or if you're going to upskill, you know, upskill, upskill plumbers or electricians to become installers, make it local to them. Yeah. You know, make the training go to them and not them go to the training. Steve, I 100% agree with you. Uh, I can work with you on this for different areas. Like I say, this is the model, and it is something that I did over the last three years, is, is look at a flexible model of how you can um, go to different training providers to set up something which are in different areas that have got a need. Trust me, if there's a need um, in regards to kind of skill set for training and there's job opportunities, there will be funding out there or there are routes or there are colleges that can pick up these kind of training elements. An example would be, I worked up in, in Northumberland, which in the area of Blythe, which is um, it's kind of a deprived area, but and say there wasn't much um, employment opportunities there. And they were going to be building a, a gigafactory project. It ended up being shelved. But what we're able to do was engage with the combined authority to identify the line of sight opportunities. If you identify the line of sight of job opportunities, we then created a training centre to develop those skills, which was a six to eight week um skills boot camp model to kind of upskill people that will get then opportunities with the contractors as well so if it might be worth having the conversation with the clients up there uh, have got the opportunities and then definitely can push forward and it is hard work say it's a lot of engagement but i think that's the key thing we've if we've got the job opportunities and we've got the energy and the persistence to keep pushing on the right areas we can make those connections to be able to set up training opportunities in whatever locations required, because that's what the the money or like AEB funding is set out to do is to provide people with short sharp training to get into employment. I can I just is... ask Stuart and Tracy a question? Yeah. Last year, one point nine billion pound from the social fund was sent back to the treasury. Do you think the government lost an opportunity there? to actually create a national training um, policy that could have, you know, um, could have put all this in, in the background and, and set it up for what is actually needed. Uh, from, from my point of things, I think Terry touched on it, and um, what you're saying as well, Steve, is I think the money almost needs to be devolved and going to all, you need to look at, training within certain areas which have different like say rural areas or built up cities that go through so i think it needs to be a, a flexible kind of funding that goes through to suit the needs of each area um, and that's what that. i was going to say because i can see from the chat i mean kim has put in there she'd like to see some of those who work with our homeless being involved with those lived you know lived experience can't be underestimated Judith also said, is it then about going into local communities, running workshops with youth clubs, places of religious worship, et cetera, et cetera. And yet 
Tracy and Kerry, and I mean, by all means, I've seen Kerry come off the chat. So whichever you'd like to jump in, this is what you're doing. And this is how you improve that social value, going kind of back to the theme of today. But like I say, it's when when the question's there around the funding, as Stuart's pointed out, the funding is there, isn't it, Tracy Kerry? But it's just getting... In a long-term prob- uh, a plan though, Matt, I think this is where there's a disconnect. So if you look at how the money's coming into social housing, the money's coming into social housing largely through the social housing decamp fund. That has a relatively short window with each wave. And so in essence, what as an organisation we've got to do is how do we sp- fund that money? So we're going to contractors and various other bits and pieces, but we've probably got a two year window and then there'll be another window and another window. But it's kind of self-perpetuating that your supply chain that you're going to go to is the same one. And those, you know, and I, I'm absolutely supportive of bringing you know, people from the homelessness backgrounds or those more disadvantaged. The reality is that homeless person that's currently in that those needs or has those needs is not going to find what the ways into delivering some of these problems anytime soon they're going to need significant support guidance training skill set and at the moment they're not all, all of these kind of funding mechanisms are not really aligned to supporting the long-term changes that are needed in the sector to be able to support those people um you know, and I do think there is a widening gap and, and inequality between those that can access um, proper education that have got the infrastructure around them that maybe live in the central t- um, larger towns and those that are in market towns, those that have more disadvantage that require because well, I, I know there's money there, but reality is a lot of the the apprenticeships they're not particularly lucrative for independent training providers or colleges to be able to run. So to be able to run the course, provide the support and really make sure that the, the, the I guess the, the people that enter them flourish, because no point lots of people going into apprenticeships and then failing. That's just going to be even worse. So it needs, you know, it needs a long term plan. I'm going to bring in Tracy. I know we've kind of jumped over a little bit in tennis there. Tracy, I'm going to bring you in, then I'll come back to you, Stuart. So Tracy. Yeah, you... I, I think it's about re-engaging. I think we've it, it's twofold for us. From the, this is just what employers are telling me. It's the need to upskill existing staff quickly. So, for example, a qualified plumber, it's a three day course to work on ground source heat pumps for a qualified electrician for solar PV and battery. It's a three day course. So it's the need. And and there is an urgent need because, as Steve pointed out, you know, this is coming at us now like a freight train. We haven't got the skilled people to be able to deliver uh, this pipeline of work. So it's upskilling the existing work workforce but then another area that the college are exploring and we're going out into job centers and hard to reach areas and hard to reach people and needs in in particular is to re-engage people that have fallen out of construction for whatever reason and because that's not a two-year apprenticeship then or a three-year apprenticeship or a four-year apprenticeship it's bespoke decarbonisation, electrification training because they've already got some skills. Stuart, your thoughts? No, so, I or, or, or agree with that. I think what to touch on what Kerry said really about when we're looking at people, for example, um, people have been homeless as well. I think this, this we need a an approach that goes across the board where sometimes the the pathway isn't for someone who's kind of. Um, Homes at the start, he's looking at job opportunities. There's more um, support that's required to to get people in the right place. You need to assess on a, an individual basis before people start being pushed down the line of here's training to go into employment. What is the kind of needs of people at the moment at the time? Is it to get them um, kind of skilled? What wraparound support do they need to be actually be in a place to then move forward into training afterwards? So it's not always the demographics you're dealing with, but it's going on a case by case basis, which training providers should be assessing as well prior to training, are the candidates in the right place? Do they need to be signposted to get other support before they engage with the programme that's looking to get them into work? So it's looking There's at- There's a really interesting point that both Kerry and Tracy made, Dan, I know in your previous role, and this is just something I was gonna to wanna to touch back on, I think it's why you've got so heavily involved in the social value piece is because you're working almost exclusively with, you know, people with, prison records and ex you know ex offenders yeah. and everything there and yet even though it was housing providers and others that you're working with during that piece is really interesting because the difference in the success and actually the value you were seeing in terms of people who 
sometimes society you know they the society perpetuates what they've given up on me and actually as soon as that mindset is changed yeah. the difference in the value that comes through there and when we talk about homelessness in other areas i agree with kerry's point we have an immediate need and on one side of it we've got this real urgent need to get everything done now because we're in such dire straits on the other side we have to plan somewhere and there's a huge swathe of people who how you know would absolutely if engaged in the right way can help us solve this deficit of shortfall which there is going to be and it's only growing all the time and this is something you're finding through that social value piece it, it is I, th I think that and that's where the recruitment strategies need to change in regards to what so i'm not going to talk about remember, but what we've set up is that we've got a 12-week program that kind of moves forward from yes we'll engage during training but you also need to engage kind of post training as well to it's a, a, like a pathway or a journey that you're taking people on that may have not been in employment to get them ready for employment and as I say give them the support when they're receiving through their kind of wages as well or how to um, kind of budget their money as well there's a lot of wraparound services that you need to kind of provide candidates yes that can come from externally from organizations like myself or the training providers but also you need to have that um, internal um, kind of team as well within the housing associations mentors or people can provide support because there are additional supportive measures that will need to be in place to uh, kind of support people coming through this pathway. But the rewards you get at the end and when you see people succeed and, and kind of change the lives around, that's that's why it's worth pursuing this pathway as well. Completely agree. I would urge, Please sorry do. guys, I would urge every organisation to contact their local college because they will have a, a schools liaison team that work in schools um, promoting this introduction to school leavers. They will work with all job centres locally. So periodically for organisations, we have Meet the Employer where we, we, we forward that to all our local job centres we work with schools our existing students and we have some amazing case studies where um lots and lots of disengaged often young people um come to us they meet the employers and secure jobs as a result of that morning or afternoon colleges have funding to be able to create programs that you need in industry we have the funding. Every college in the land has been allocated funding for this. We're building houses as trading rigs, four of them, on our, on our site. That's half a million pounds project in itself. We're already delivering these courses. The stats show that most, a lot of organisations haven't engaged with post-16 training providers for a long length of time. I'd, I'd urge you just to have a conversation with your business engagement, employer engagement team, locally where you live. You'd probably be quite amazed at the pool of talent within those buildings and those training providers and colleges, but the support, especially in the decarbonisation stuff that they can offer you. It's worth just having a half an hour chat. And the I other organisation... Like oh, go on. Yeah, the other organisation that we work really closely with and don't all shout me down in flames when I say these letters, CITB, organizations and, and every principal contractor or every large organization will have contractors working with them. Companies are blissfully unaware. They can claim £10,000 for taking on an apprentice at the moment. You know, there's funding available to be able to support this kind of stuff. Really and, and And you just need to be talking, or your colleges will be, well, it's a one-stop shop approach often with uh, a good training provider or a good college. And they will say, right, they'll act as a broker and they'll say, tell us what you need. We'll develop a flex program through our AEB stream of funding. Um, it doesn't exist at the moment, but but we'll we'll make it work. The, the other thing I'd say with colleges, we're a victim um, of of what's happening in the industry, sadly, and that the skill shortages. Sometimes trying to attract qualified tutors and lecturers and assessors into our college is a real, real challenge. I was going to say and, the point that Kerry put in the chat there, which was yeah. what barriers to entering training. How do we resolve these? And we've got only a couple of minutes left, but that's yeah. another session we can do. But uh, I have thirty-five. Yeah, I have thirty-five apprentices from different organisations waiting to start refrigerator and aircon. Can't run it because we haven't had a tutor for twelve months. And there is another big part of the problem because we big can have the, the we can do the part that Stuart's doing. So maybe we yeah. follow this up later with yeah. another round table on. Yeah. on that piece around training and guidance because certainly as well when we've got 
um, touches quite nicely actually onto my my next roundtable event is on Friday, and it's going to be on professionalization in the sector uh, and the consultation that's going on at the moment. And that's going to be the same issue they're going to have, which is we can do the professionalization, but have we got the tutors and the trainers to do it? I'm going to last couple of points from the chat, which is Steve McKenzie. What mustn't be forgotten is we are only talking about residential properties needing these skills. It gets even worse when you include commercial. And I know Stuart will talk about that briefly. Kim Sutton, most charities like mine have a complete wraparound service. We are only one of we are one of the only small charities in London that has a full five day a week service that includes a five day a week health team with care coordinator plus counsellors. They're well supported. Look at collaborations and partnerships. And this is very much in the case with colleges as well. They also collaborate with schools and colleges regarding homelessness. And it is important to know we have already, uh, it's important to know we have people that are working, living in cars, et cetera. So it's already happening. People just don't know about it. Stuart, Tracy, Kerry, everyone who's brought to the same day, thank you so much for bringing it. Stuart, Can I just say to... a final thing? Sorry. Sorry, Matt. Yeah. If, if, if any of you who do have a presence through organisations in the Midlands, please, please, please get them to contact me and I'll have conversations with with, with anyone about, about this sort of thing and, and move something forward. Not a problem. Thank you very much, Tracy. Stuart, final thoughts on the session day and anything you'd like to leave everybody with in terms of where to start this journey? Because it's so important we get started. Well, I think the one of the key things that you touched on is collaboration and say opening up discussions is the, the main thing. So thank you all for kind of sharing on this today. Um, for me, if you've got job opportunities, um, I'd say if you get in touch, I can then work with you and we work collaboratively to look at the pathways and we can get a programme that fits and works for yourself. And that's engaging with any organisation that we need to, to be able to get the support for the candidates, but just get the pathways through some opportunities, and then we'll see what we can build together. Really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Let's to Stuart Burt and Tracy Kerr. So I know Stuart, you're at sburt at vengroup.com. Tracy, find you on LinkedIn. Have the conversations. If anybody needs to get in touch with people, please do. Uh, as I say, the next roundtable is on Friday. I'm finalising next Tuesday because we've had a slight dropout and we're changing around, so I'll confirm that shortly. But next roundtable is on Friday to do with the uh, professionalisation consultation. So until then, thank you very much, everybody. Cheers. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Really appreciate it.